Let's talk to Amara Sophia Alahi, uh, LBC's Midlands correspondent, about these two uh, boys, believed to be the UK's youngest knife murderers. Uh, they've been convicted and detained for a minimum of eight years and six months. That sentencing happened just in the last hour or so. Amara, tell us more. Well, Sheila, this has been a shocking, unparalleled case. Uh, cast your mind back to the 13th of November last year. That was when the unprovoked savage attack on Mr Cesar High took place. He was walking with a friend in a park in Wolverhampton when he encountered the two boys. A brief confrontation took place before one of the killers pulled out a 16-inch machete which he'd bought online for £40. What happened next was a ferocious attack lasting just seconds where Mr Cesar High was punched, kicked and stabbed. Now during the trial and sentencing special arrangements had to be made for the boys because they're so young. They were sitting in the main well of the court instead of the dock. Alongside them were family members and specially trained staff to help them understand proceedings. And today, when the judge passed their sentences, she addressed each one directly using very simple language. The first defendant did not have any previous convictions, but he was known to the police and had been carrying knives. But that has to be considered in the context that he was the victim of trafficking and extremely vulnerable. I have taken into account everything I know about the first defendant and what he did, and in my judgment the minimum time he should spend in custody is eight years six months. From that must be deducted the 315 days that he's already spent in custody. The first defendant will remain on licence for the rest of his life. This means that there are conditions that will be decided when the parole board decide it's appropriate for him to leave custody and he will have to follow those conditions for the rest of his life and if he does not do so, then he may have to go back to custody. I now turn to the second defendant. The second defendant was much closer to 12 in age than 13 at the date of these offences. The pre-sentence report for the second defendant has been prepared by the two social workers who were allocated to work with him from when he was remanded in a secure unit, unit in November last year. It is dated July 2024 and is a detailed and comprehensive report which has also gathered information about the second defendant from all relevant sources, both in terms of documents and speaking to the relevant people, including the second defendant. I have read all this report with care and taken all that it says into account. The report explains in detail the second defendant's background and upbringing, the upheaval caused to his childhood by moves in the location of his family's home, some of which was spent in a refuge and the disruption this caused to his childhood. The starting point of 13 years needs to be adjusted downwards because the second defendant's chronological age was that he'd relatively recently turned 12 at the date of the offence. His emotional maturity and development age was not below his chronological age. He does not have any mental health problems but may have dyslexia. I then have to take into account that he's now showing maturity beyond his years he is responding very well in custody. He was of good character and has shown remorse for what has happened. I have taken into account everything I know about the second defendant and what he did, and in my judgment, the minimum time he should spend in custody is eight years, six months. From that must be deducted the 315 days that he has already spent in custody. I appreciate that this is the very same as for the first defendant, but having applied the guideline, the factors that have led me there are different. But when I have considered and balanced the individual features of each defendant, that is the clear conclusion that I have reached for each of them. The second defendant will also remain on licence for the rest of his life. This means that there will be conditions decided uh, when he leaves a custody which he will have to follow for the rest of his life. If he breaks those conditions, then he may have to return to custody. I order no separate penalty 
for the first defendant on count two, possession of a bladed article in a public place. I order no separate penalty for the second defendant on count two. I order forfeiture and destruction of the machete. Both of the defence councils had asked for moderation because of the boys' ages, their lack of maturity and vulnerability, and it seems the judge has taken that into account. Yesterday, the court heard that one of the defendants had experienced significant trauma in his life and suffers from behavioural and neurodevelopmental issues. He, he also, uh, the judge said, was being groomed and exploited for criminality, while the second defendant also had a troubled childhood living in a refuge at one point. The boys will remain in secure accommodation and it will be up to the parole board to decide what happens to them after they've served their sentences, but there will be conditions on them for the rest of their lives. Mr C. Sahai was from Anguilla in the Caribbean and was in the UK for eye surgery. His family say he'd hoped to continue his studies here and become an engineer. They were watching sentencing remotely and yesterday we heard an impact statement, statement from them that was read out in court. They said this was a tragic, unexpected and senseless murder. Losing a child is a parent's worst nightmare. Now just a short a uh, while ago, we heard from Dorothea Hodge, the UK representative to the government of Anguilla, who said the family were disappointed with the sentences. The family had hoped that the sentence handed down today would reflect this abhorrent violence. Whilst they recognise that three young lives have been destroyed, they alone have lost their son forever and they do not feel that the sentence reflects the loss they have suffered daily since their son was murdered. Now, West Midlands Police said this was a shocking case and they'd never worked on a murder investigation like this before. They also spoke after sentencing and acknowledged more work needed to be done to tackle knife crime. So, Sheila, it's clear from all those involved with the case that it has sent shockwaves far beyond Wolverhampton and the Midlands.